Well, good evening and Merry Christmas to you all. It is a great blessing to gather as a church family. This is our church family gathering uh, for Christmas. I'm so glad that you all came to worship the Lord and to celebrate with one another the greatest gift ever given, the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to reflect on that a little bit this evening with you. I'm going to share a few thoughts and then a little later on, I'm going to invite the children, elementary school age, to come up uh, to read the Christmas story together. I want you to kind of think through what kind of a conversation uh, you and I might have if I had the opportunity to sit down uh, in your living room and just have a spiritual conversation. On a night like tonight, I realize there's a lot of different folks in the room. Uh, there are those who know the Lord, are walking daily with Him. There are those who know the Lord, but maybe haven't been walking so closely with him. And then there are those who are here because a family member invited you and you love your family, and so uh, you came and want to share uh, this tradition with them. There's always different hearts in the room. And I want to direct maybe this conversation, uh, if you'll allow me to, to those of you for whom Christ is not central in your life. If you were to just take an honest look at your priorities, what you live for, what fills your heart and mind day by day, it would be hard for you to say that Christ is first and that Christ is central. So this message that I'd like to share with you is, I've given a title and it's this, Jesus is your Lord, not your etc. Jesus is your Lord, not your etc. You know, there are obviously those who reject the gospel message entirely. They don't believe that Jesus was born of a virgin and laid in a manger. They don't believe that he was the son of God sent to save us from our sins. They don't believe and they're quite open about not believing. There are others who are quite open about the fact that they do believe. They have confessed that Jesus is Lord and their lives reflect that. But then there's this other group, and it's to you I really want to speak, and that's a group that considers yourself to be a Christian, but really, if you were honest, Jesus is your etc. He's in the background of your life, not the foreground. In our day, there are millions of people who consider themselves to be Christians, and they believe they're going to heaven. When you talk to them, they describe themselves as being really spiritual, but not very religious. What do they mean by that? It means that they, they think they have faith, but that faith does not translate into Things like church attendance or talking to other people about God or much of anything else. Their faith seems to be based on the famous motto if you, well, some of you aren't old enough to remember. I'm not old enough to remember it myself, but I saw it on YouTube. Um, there was a 1950s Brill Cream hair commercial. I remember the saying, and I was curious where it came from. Have you ever heard the saying, a little dab will do you? I grew up hearing that phrase, a little dab will do you, and I thought, well, where did this come from? So I looked it up and saw on YouTube, 1950s hair cream, where this kind of guy with loser hair puts a little dab on his hair, and then all the girls really like him, and you know, the motto goes, a little dab will do you. A lot of people's faith seems to be based more on that motto for hair cream than on the word of God. Just a little dab of faith will do you seems to be what they think. Can I ask you to consider whether that is even a rational position? The gospel proclaims that Jesus Christ is the son of God, that he was born of a virgin, that angels announced his birth, that he lived a perfect life, he was crucified for sins, buried, rose again on the third day, ascended to heaven, and is coming back to establish an eternal kingdom. That is the message of the scriptures. If you believe that, there is no way that a little dab will do you. 
Jesus is Lord, not your etc. I call some of these folks etc. Christians, not in a pejorative sense, but because it's a good description of their spiritual life. Religion is something they include in their lives at Easter, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. They are etc. Christians, Easter, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. But the rest of the year, Christ is at best an afterthought. Etc. Christians think a little dab of religion will do you, and they even pride themselves on doing everything in moderation, even religion in moderation. They'll tell you that they're people of faith, but then they'll quickly add, but I'm not a religious fanatic. When you talk to people what they, and really find out what they mean by not being a religious fanatic, they, they mean that they're not people who do fanatical things like going to church every week or doing radical things like telling others about Jesus, by not being a religious fanatic, they mean they keep whatever they think about God private and occasional and in the etc. of life. It's not that their faith isn't important to them, it's just that lots of other things are more important, if truth be told. They wouldn't say that church is unimportant, but... Their schedule shows that soccer leagues and golf or just sleeping in are more important. They would say that God is important to them, but their priorities and their lifestyle shows that lots and lots of other things are more important. Jesus, again, is located somewhere in the etc. of their lives. At the Christmas concerts here at Calvary, I preached on Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, which says that Jesus is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. That is the message of Scripture. That Christ rose from the dead so that he would have first place in everything. So this verse and the rest of Scripture state quite plainly that Jesus cannot be relegated to the etc. of your life. He can't be a low priority. If he is a low priority, he is no priority at all. If there's one lesson that we should learn from the Christmas history, it is that Jesus must either be rejected and opposed, as he was by King Herod, and then later on by the Pharisees and Sadducees, or he must be received and worshipped as he was by the shepherds and than by the wise men. You must either receive him as Lord and make him first in your life, or you must reject him as an unwanted imposition and exclude him from your life altogether. There is no middle ground. Christ did not leave a little dab will do you option. He says, come follow me, not come occasionally think about me or occasionally reference me, but come follow me. In fact, he says, take up your cross and follow me. Leave your old life, die to self and follow me. I want to read you a passage of scripture which very clearly talks about the supremacy of Christ and then gives an exhortation. This is Hebrews chapter 1. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be a father to him and he shall be a son to me. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. 
Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands." They will perish, but you remain, and they will all become old like a garment, and like a mantle you will roll them up. Like a garment they will also be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? For this reason... We must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? It's the question I want you to ask yourself. How will you escape if you neglect so great a salvation? A salvation. Friends, my fear for you, if you are an etc. Christian, is that you're not really a Christian at all. Rather, like Herod, your main interest in Jesus seems to be figuring out how to keep him from taking over the throne. I fear that some think they are Lord and King. Maybe Lord and King of a really tiny kingdom, a kingdom of one, yourself, but Lord and King nonetheless. I want to invite you tonight to give up the throne to the one to whom it belongs. That King came lowly and meek because he wanted to beckon you, he came lowly in a manger. And he beckons you to come. Some of you are thinking, great, I came to Christmas Eve and here it is, it's the guilt trip. You know, you, I came on Easter, I came on Thanksgiving, I came on Christmas, and now I'm getting the etc. Easter, Thanksgiving, Christmas guilt trip. This is the point where maybe most pastors would apologize for the guilt trip, I don't. If that's you, you should feel guilt. Guilt is a warning sign given by God to you. Guilt should lead you to grace, to forgiveness, and to change. I want to gently and humbly and lovingly suggest to you that the recognition of spiritual guilt is exactly what you need in order to help you realize that you need the gift of saving grace. Spiritual uh, spiritual guilt leads you to saving grace. Could it be, dear friend, that the reason Jesus has been relegated to the etc. of your life is that you have never received him as Savior and Lord? God has given this great gift and you have never received it. It's sitting unopened under the tree of your life and has been for years. I want to invite you tonight to open that gift and open your heart to receive that gift. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's a gift given to you. In fact, 2 Corinthians 9, 15 says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. How do you receive it? Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you gotta step off the throne and give it to him. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That is the good news of the gospel. I want to invite now the elementary school children to come on up to the stage. And I'm going to ask uh, maybe, uh, I probably need three or four moms and dads to come and sit down in these front two pews just for safety uh, with the height of our stage. But I want to invite all the kids, if you're elementary school age, to come right up here and just kind of sit down, crisscross applesauce right around me, and we're going to read the Christmas story together. Okay, kids, this is one of my favorite things I get to do. 
Hey, thanks for coming up. First one up, the brave one leading the crowd. There you go. Good to see you. All right, just gather right in, gather right around. You can kind of spread out. Yep. Oh, wow, look at these wonderful kids. And if I could get a few adults up into these two pews right here just for safety because of the stage. And if we could scoot forward, kids, just a little bit away from the edge. There you go. Keep a good distance between you and that edge. Thank you. Wow. Oh. What's that? Where do you want to sit? Why didn't you sit? Could you sit right there for me? Thank you, sweetheart. All right. Well, kids, I know you're excited for Christmas, and you know, tomorrow you're going to give and receive gifts, and we give and receive gifts because we're celebrating the greatest gift ever given, which was Jesus. So we're going to read the Christmas story together, and I want you to listen real carefully as we read from Luke chapter 2. This is Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Now in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, he was the big king, that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Anyone want to trade names with Quirinius? Anyone? No? Okay. No, neither do I. And I I don't even want to try to pronounce it, because I'm still not sure after all these years how to say Quirinius. Everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. And while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. I think I would be too. Can you imagine if an angel appeared? But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today, in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, let's go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen just as had been told them. Isn't it wonderful that God sent his greatest gift? How many of you have know John 3.16? Do you guys know John 3.16? Wow, that's great. Well, John 3.16 says that God loved us so much that he gave his only son, Jesus, so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Everlasting life is the greatest gift ever given. And that comes through believing in Jesus. Did you know what the good news is? The good news is that if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, if you believe that he died on the cross, not just for somebody's sin, but for your sin, and if you believe that 
he rose from the dead, you will be saved. God will give you that gift of everlasting life. You know, on Christmas, you, someone gives you a present and you, know, you have to unwrap it to receive it. Well, believing is how we receive the gift. And then I don't know what you guys do in your household, but in mine, whenever someone gives us a gift and we open it, and after we get the gift, we always go and we say thank you to whoever gave it to us, and we give them a big hug and we tell them that we love them. And that's how we should respond to God when he gives us this gift. We should receive the gift and we should thank him and we should tell him that we love him. So why don't we do that right now? Is that, why don't we do that together, okay? So we're going to talk to God. So let everyone fold your hands and close your eyes. And prayer is talking to God. And did you know that God listens when you pray? He does. And so we can tell him thank you and tell him that we love him, okay? So let's fold our hands and pray. Lord, we thank you for the greatest gift ever given, the gift of your son. Lord, we were lost in our sins. We've all done bad things. We've thought bad things and said bad things, done bad things. And Lord, we feel guilty because you've given us a conscience that warns us when we do wrong. Lord, that conscience points us to Jesus and to his cross and to salvation through him. Thank you that our sins can be forgiven by grace. Nothing we earn but a gift that you give us. Lord, I pray that each one of these boys and girls would receive your gift of salvation by faith. That they would repent of their sins and believe the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Lord, when we receive a gift, we want to be sure to say thank you. And that we love you. And so, Lord, we come tonight to say thank you for the greatest gift ever given. We love you. Thank you for first loving us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Weren't the kids amazing? You guys were awesome. Good job. So you guys can go back to your seat now. <laughs> Let's stay back from the edge a little bit here, okay? Yep. <laughs> yep. Okay, the stairs are right over there. Oh, that's sweet. Okay, so you can go right down the stairs. Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> well, the gospel is a gift. It's a gift that is to be received and then passed on. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And we're going to conclude this evening uh, with candle lighting. We're going to light candles and pass them on one to another. And this is symbolizing Jesus being the light of the world and someone passing the good news on to us that good news warming our hearts and lives, giving us light. And then it reminds us of, of our responsibility to pass that good news on to others. So I want to in, invite uh, those who are...